Hello, I'm David Tricky. I'm the co-director of the UK Trauma Council. The UK Trauma Council is a project here at the Anna Freud Center where we try to bring together the UK's leading child trauma experts and produce resources and guidance for those working with traumatized children, young people and families. Today I'm here with Ted Bowman and we're going to talk about shattered dreams. Ted, you've written a great deal about shattered dreams and I wondered if you could tell us a bit more what you mean by that. Sure. Gladly, and thanks for asking me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, early in my career, I was doing work around the, the family life cycle, from meeting someone, began to build a relationship onto a uh, commitment, birth of a child, and on through the, the life cycle. And we thought if we got people to have uh, good experiences at those developmental transitions, that they would do better in life. So we could help them around child development, around parent education, around uh, things that were happening in life. And so a lot of the early work that I was doing was in parent support. And so in parent groups around uh, uh, of a single child, of a, a new child raising an adolescent, and then children that had uh, different uh, levels of ability. Uh, might have a medical or mental health condition or, or whatever uh, could happen. And so we were doing uh, support groups uh, for them. And in those days, I was naive about the distinction that you've just asked because the groups were often focused on a particular topic because we had learned that the more specific we could be, then those who attended knew they would be with their cohorts. They would be with people who were dealing similarly with a child with diabetes. They would be dealing with someone who had a grandpa die. And so... Right. Uh, and that was uh, important for them that they were with people who knew what they were talking about. And so we would move around the circle and ask people to introduce themselves around the focus of the group. And the reason we asked that was not to put them on the hot seat or, or that kind of thing, but rather it's important that uh, if something's unmentionable, it's also unmanageable. And so it's important that the parent might say, hello, my name is Ted. I'm the parent of a child with or I'm here because uh, my father, my child's grandfather, died. And we invited them to begin to say those words, as difficult and hard they might be. But in the midst of that, some people did not play by the rules. And uh, rather than giving that story, they said, this wasn't supposed to happen. Ted, this is unfair. I never expected this to happen in our family. Ted, I don't know how to deal with this. Well, I still thought they were talking about the death the diagnosis, the, the condition, the divorce, the whatever had been the focus of support. And so I didn't learn about shattered dreams until sessions had passed. And finally, in one of the sessions, another parent, not a professional, not a co-leader, turned to the parent who said, this is unfair, I didn't expect this. Uh, what do I do with this? Uh, this is so unexpected. And someone said, it sounds to me like you had some pictures of your life pictures of the way your life was supposed to be, and life hasn't turned out to match the pictures. Ted, uh, uh, to the person, it sounds like you had some dreams, and those dreams are shattered, those dreams are lost. And immediately the person who had blurted out their earlier statement said, yes, that's it. Now, all of our plans, all of our hopes, this wasn't supposed to have happened. And others in the room said, me too, me too, me too. And I sat there a bit numb because they knew more about shattered dreams than I did. In the UK Trauma Council, much of our work is about providing the environment where children and young people are most likely to recover. And I wonder whether your thinking about shattered dreams has any implications for how we can create that environment. Yes, and we need to draw on the, the, our creative colleagues, uh, both in terms of architecture, in terms of arrangements of uh, the ambiance of a place and so on. I think of the old story of uh, adult friends who came to visit their adult friends at, their, uh, at a home and they tolerated the children uh, for a few minutes hoping they would go to bed soon. And so the message to the children was that uh, this is an adult place, not a child's place. Whereas there would be other friends who came and wanted to see everybody there, including the children. Right. And so the analogy, the metaphor I'm using is 
does the child get a message and the place and the ambiance and the culture and the welcome and the, the greeting at the door and uh, whatever is happening there that we're here for you, that this is your place. Uh, I remember my growing up years, uh, there was uh, a man who was the, the so-called deacon of the church and sort of organized the carrying of the offering and uh, some of the other uh, rituals. And he broke the rule. And when I was age 12 or 13, allowed me to uh, collect the offering with the old guys, the men. And it was just such a gift that he treated me as if I was uh, already a member of the church. Right, right. That's, it's that kind of thing that is the metaphor in terms of, uh, are we listening to the children? Are we welcoming them? Is, can this be their place? And can they feel at ease here? If they do that, then I think behind your question, it may be the, uh, the more that they feel welcomed, uh, kind of at home here, people are listening to me, my story, they're more likely to be forthright and continue to deal with the trauma, the grief, uh, the disruptive change, whatever's going on in their lives. How does thinking about shattered dreams fit with other theories of loss or other psychological theories? I think it's quite copacetic with, uh, can blend in, uh, just has not been named as much uh, as others. Uh, um, a lot of people, when you hear the words grief and loss, and you ask them to free associate with that, the first uh, words often that come off their tongue uh, are the D words of dying and death, because they think those are the big losses. But shattered dreams can be related to a death, but it's a non-death loss. And the person who died may have been the historian, may have been the cheerleader, may have been the one who made your, your special food, uh, may have been uh, your, your coach uh, on it. And so there's the shattered dream that I didn't get more time with or I, I didn't get a chance to be with. Uh, or it may be the interruption of the future story, the, uh, the person who was going to accompany you down the aisle at a, at a wedding or be with you at the graduation and so on. And so it's that interruption of the future story. Uh, and so it overlaps with many of the, the grief theories uh, and especially the more recent one of uh, the ability to have an oscillation between times and places and people with whom to do grieving work, that that gets heard, acknowledged, and so on, but also times and places and venues and people who help me to have respite, to play, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to find resiliency, to be distracted, uh, to do other things, that if I can move back and forth between worlds in which I am grieving, but also times for play and distraction and other things, that seems to uh, 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 suggest a more healthy kind of way. Because if we get stuck in or emphasize one side or the other, it's, it's a one-sided life. Uh, Nell Nottings, an educator, says it may not be the case that joy and grief can occur simultaneously but they can occur alternately, right. that we can move almost in nanoseconds, certainly within the space of a day or a time or a week, from a period of deep sorrow or trauma to also a time of laughing and smiling and enjoying jokes and whatever. So does that mean that you have these two things going on? One is about grieving the loss of your dream, yes. but also developing some reasonable hope about the future and a, a different story, is that what you're saying? Yes, and, and the possibility of dreaming again, right. albeit that it might be an adapted dream. So I need to grieve the shattered dream in order to embrace the new dream, the, uh, the adjusted dream. Uh, if you're, um, uh, I know some people who uh, were coaches, uh, but also quite athletic themselves, and so mobility and running and exercising and so on uh, was their cup of tea, their, their, one of the highlights of their lives. And then because of a, an auto accident or a spinal cord injury or a brain tumor or whatever, they're no longer able to do that. Well, there's the shattered dream that they've lost health, they've lost mobility, they've lost uh, one of the anchors of their lives and so on. But some of those people continue to be coaches and stayed involved in and did it in another way by creating webinars, by, by teaching, by 
uh, also perhaps moving to a different kind of, if they were coaches in terms of uh, people who were mobile like they had been, but now people who may be more challenged in terms of mobility, that they can begin to work with them. Right. And the, the, the power then of athleticism and, and uh, uh, doing those kinds of things together. So it's adjusting the dreams. But we need to grieve the shattered dream because uh, one person has put it, if we're, dream, if we're holding on to the old chapter of our lives, we're not dreaming and reading the next chapter. Right. right. So uh, grieve the chat, uh, shattered dream, there's the grieving part, and then to see if I can embrace a new dream. For those of us who are practitioners working with children, families, what are the implications of this way of thinking? You may want to I may want to hear just a bit more in terms of implications. It's uh, the part of my first response, and tell me if this is what you're asking, David, is um, just the importance of listening to these stories, and not just what I call the conspicuous losses. If they're being seen in a medical or a mental health setting, or any of those kinds of provider settings, there's often an assessment, a diagnosis, a label, uh, something. Uh, that's a name for the reason they're being there, but that's only part of the story. And I think many children in particular, but also lots of adults and even old people like me, I want to say there's more to me than my, whatever the condition might be, the Parkinson's, the, the diabetes, uh, the depression, you know, my addiction, you know, my, my time that I, I was in jail, there's more to me than. And so it's uh, listening to uh, these various accounts of their lives and to, to help them to embrace who they are now or who they can be or, or the aspirations they have. Uh, I did, did a workshop with some people who often wanted to get the workshop attendees a bit out of their chairs and moving around just to kind of loosen up a bit so they could engage then in, in more of the workshop. And so they were doing a little uh, kind of music uh, and then dance and so on. And she said, but if you're not ready to dance today, think of a time when you aspire to be a dancer. So there's acknowledging both sides. And if this is a day you say, oh, not, I can't dance today. Well, think of a time that you aspire to be a dancer. And some of the people then began to get up and move a bit. Right. So it's honoring that we need to meet the persons where they are. How might these ideas about shattered dreams apply to groups or to whole communities? Uh, we're, we're struggling with that one right now because there's so much division uh, in our world. Uh, and part of, uh, let me back up just a bit and talk about, we've been using mostly personal and family examples. Yeah. And a lot of people at this time uh, and many of the places in the world are less focused on their personal and family losses and more about what a writer in The Guardian called the great grief. And he used capital letters for great. And his definition of great grief was expansive. It included fears about the planet. And will there be a planet still alive for the grandchildren? Fears about the divisions between the haves and have nots, the racial reckoning that's going on the issues of leadership, especially in the United States and the divided uh, country that we have there now and all the ways those are bumping in together and so on. And so some people are dealing more a shattered dream about the world around them than they are about their personal lives. Yeah. But it may include their personal lives and wondering how this is gonna be for their children and grandchildren. And so it's important that as we listen, we listen for What's the dominant narrative? Uh, lots of people are dealing with multiple losses at a time. And so uh, which one shall we face today? Where might we get started with this? And if people feel a little overwhelmed with the larger losses, how am I to make a difference in the world? Well, maybe I try to make a difference in my household life about how we take care of Mother Earth, how we began to talk about people who are different than us in this household, how we begin to interact with the, the school, the, uh, the, the, the neighborhoods around, how we began in a place like Anna Freud to 
deal with people who have uh, different life experiences because of their own mental health, but have things to offer us because they can teach us about things that we have not experienced ourselves, yeah. that I can learn from that and learn how to cope with some of my own insecurities, some of my own foibles, some of my own behaviors, because they've had to deal with something that's quite different than mine, but there may be things that we can teach one another. What a lovely uh, gift we can give one another. Is it possible for shattered dreams to become chronic sorrows? Ah, again, uh, wonderful questions. Uh, uh, I like uh, these kinds of questions because they're getting at the heart of the issues. Uh, uh, a, a writer, a colleague of mine has distinguish between chronic sorrow and shattered dreams uh, this way, that, that many people uh, who will live with a chronic sorrow all their lives, but that does not mean that they are clinically depressed. That does not mean that they are ill. It does not mean that they're holding on and stuck in their grieving. But for example, if someone has a miscarriage, if someone has a stillbirth, if someone's child dies early in life, they may carry that sadness all of their lives. I met uh, some parents uh, here in England, uh, and uh, one of the parents wrote a piece called Say Neil to Me, N-E-I-L was the, the child's uh, name. And because the child had died early, none of the friends, none of the people in the circle were using the child's name. And this mother was not berating, I suppose you might even call it that, but gentle, uh, respectful berating. Please say Neil to me. You want me to move on. You want me to get on with my life. You want me to continue to be a happy parent and so on. I, my child is both alive and dead. He's alive in me. He's also, I know that he's died, so I'm not stuck there. I'm living my life, but I don't want you to move his, his name, his story from the rest of my life. Please say Neil to me. And so it's, it's those kinds of ways in which uh, we move from that person's living with chronic sorrow, but still has the ability to embrace life, joy, happiness, has other children. It doesn't always happen that people have other children, but finding ways to embrace life fully, to live the hospice rule around the world. It's not about dying, but to live as fully as you can for as long as you can. And so it's that kind of philosophy that there may be a chronic sorrow related to, to poverty, related to prejudice, related to historical trauma, to the, the incidences that you talked about in terms of PTSD, as well as the example I gave of a, a child's death and so on. Uh, whatever it is, we may carry a chronic sorrow about that, that we missed out on that, or that was taken away too soon, or I wish that I could have had that a bit longer. So there's a chronic sorrow but I'm not stuck in it. I also have the ability to grow life uh, fully, right. even with that sorrow. Right. The, other, the other side is when some people do need help, uh, medical or mental health help, because they have trouble, it's, it perseverates and becomes the dominant narrative. And so in this case, the chronic sorrow is there, but it's not the dominant narrative. Mm -hmm.